Today's episode is brought to you by our good friends down at Discount Fire and Flame Incorporated. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary to put your enemies to the fire and flame, can you trust that hand-me-down flamer or inferno launcher will perform when you need it? When it comes to dissolving the bands that connect one with their existence, and to assume among the powers of the stars the separate but equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's god entitle them, do you really want to take the chance that your weaponry will cease to function? You should contact Discount Fire and Flame to make sure you're able to pursue your happiness without the doubt that comes with substandard weaponry. We've got a wide variety of flame weapons to meet your every need. From infantry grade to mighty battle max sized, Discount Fire and Flame has you covered. After all, it's better to have fire and not need it than need fire and not have it. Contact your local clan Seafox representative today and we'll make sure fire heads your way. Tukid, January 21st, 3068. Late morning. Adept Chalmers kept his keen eye on the scrubland ahead of him. Scanning the slowly swaying grasses with his advanced tactical headgear, he was looking for anything that might tip off the location of his prey. Controlling his breathing, remembering all the telltale signs of disruption, he casually rotated through the various modes. Infrared was clear. Movement only showed the swirling tips of the yellow and white grasses and a rainbow of tracers. A deep thud interrupted the peaceful air and Chalmers glanced over at the target. A perfectly cylindrical hole had just been burned into the forehead of one of the target dummies. Dang it, he grumbled, going back to scanning for the shooter. You know, we really should make this more difficult by making you practice on a mud flat, he said into the calm link. The response came in the form of a second thud. This time, the second target slumped forward, most of the dummy's neck now blown to bits and the remaining chunks smoldering. At least wave or something. Give me a sporting chance, Chalmers chuckled into the comm link. Suddenly, just a few dozen meters from his position on the back of the four-wheeler, Adept Ying stood quickly in his augmented power armor, his head pointed up into the sky, the laser pulse rifle pointing at the ground. The plating of his suit tried to compensate for the new position, shimmering with the transition to be half grassy and half light sky blue. Oh, come on, I didn't mean quit entirely, Chalmers responded. Ying's voice in the comm link was weak, barely more than a whisper. Chalmers missed his first words, but heard them the second time. Look up. Lifting his gaze and turning to the east, Adept Chalmers nearly fell off the four-wheeler in shock. In low orbit above Tukiad, a fleet of ships was clearly visible. One might be forgiven for thinking that they were an unexpected Comstar expedition or a visit from the high-ranking 21st Lancers official. Unfortunately, those hopes were dashed as the streaks of fire began to rain down onto the planet. We... we need to get back to the base. R right now, Ying managed to utter before the shockwaves and sounds of an oncoming apocalyptic firestorm hit them. Of all the Inner Sphere Battle Armor projects, it's not surprising that Comstar's entries to the Pantheon of Designs were cutting edge. The key to their advantage, of course, was access to Star League technology, that had been lost to the rest of the Inner Sphere through the Ameris Civil War and Succession Wars. The battle armor example we're going to cover today is tied directly to the Star League design efforts. In order to cover it adequately, we're going to have to take a leap back and discuss the earliest research into individual battle armor. In the dawn of the 28th century, the Star League seemed as if it might have finally unified most of humanity under a single banner. While those in the periphery might take issue with the claim that this was a peaceful existence, that's a discussion for another video. Tragically, the First Lord, Jonathan Cameron, was beset up by nightmares that left him deeply concerned that they were in fact premonitions of a dark and tragic future. In an attempt to avoid this terrible fate for the Star League, resources were dumped into producing a litany of new weapon systems and technologies. A flood of new battle mechs, tanks, aerospace fighters, and infantry support technology wouldn't save the Star League, but it would plant countless seeds for later advancements. Though wearable systems for augmenting the strength and endurance of people had been around for a thousand years, taking the leap toward their weaponization proved problematic for a variety of reasons. A very common complication was the litany of demands made for any battle armor that were simply impossible to all incorporate into a single design. One faction would demand high-powered weaponry, while others wanted speed. 
Some wanted thick armor plating, while others wanted to emphasize dexterity and stealth. The programs defined all of the complaints that people make about design by committee. Finally, after nearly 15 years of design and redesign, and redesign of the redesign, the first functioning prototypes of light power armor went into testing. One of these, designated the Nighthawk Mark 21, was presented to the Star League Defense Force High Command in 2718. Much to the relief of the designers and engineers of the Nighthawk, the power armor fared well in testing. Though it was never intended to provide protection from heavy fire, the Nighthawk could offer protection from indirect fire, shrapnel, and glancing blows from most anti-personnel weapons. The armor weighs in at 400 kilograms, allowing the user to travel at a consistent 10.8 kilometers per hour, and is equipped with jump jets that can carry it up to 90 meters at a time, which matches your standard clan elemental in the 31st century. While the armor only provides a 2 plus 1 level of protection, it's a stealth standard, so the goal of the user is to avoid being seen rather than trying to tank incoming fire. The combination of mobility and stealth allowed the Nighthawk's user unparalleled performance in small unit actions and special forces missions. The testing process was prolonged by the bureaucratic wrangling that continued to plague the project. After two years of successful tests, the armor was finally deemed worthy of production. The Nighthawk ended up in distribution to special forces units first, including the famous Blackhearts. Though their missions in the early years were shrouded in secrecy, there were rumors across the great houses of special forces units that seemed superhuman in their capabilities. As far as weapons and equipment go, the Mark 21 is not designed to carry anything other than an ECM suite that can cover up to 15 meters around it, and the extended life support which allows the user to function in both low oxygen environments and outside the norm temperatures. However, the Nighthawk's user typically carried a Mauser 960 assault system, which was the standard issue pulse laser rifle of the SLDF. It also had a built-in grenade launcher and a retractable vibroblade bayonet for up-close negotiations. There was a Mark 22 version of the Nighthawk, which dropped the ECM suite in exchange for a grenade launcher located on the left arm. However, the production of the Mark 22 was interrupted by the Ameris coup and collapse of the Star League. Only scant numbers of the prototype ever saw use. By the end of the Civil War, none of the Mark 22s were preserved, and only a tiny number of Mark 21s were squirreled away in caches to be discovered later. We now know that archived research data on the Nighthawk and other battle armor designs was taken by Kerensky's forces when they departed the Inner Sphere during the Exodus. It's quite likely that the elemental battle armor was the result of the continued evolution of these Star League designs. Comstar would, in fact, rediscover the Nighthawk after Jerome Blake seized control of Terra and the storehouses of the Star League were searched for long-lost technologies. Unfortunately, attempts to reverse-engineer the design were only partially successful, resulting in a design known as the Tornado, which we'll cover in another video. With time, independent research as well as discoveries of other Star League caches of information and technology led to a revitalized effort to produce the Nighthawk. Both the Word of Blake and Comstar were producing them by the mid-3060s. Comstar even built an entire production line on the little-known planet of no historical significance named Tukid. Right? No nothing really important going on there, right? I uh, kid, I kid. Unfortunately for Comstar, that production line would end up getting destroyed in 3068 after only a little bit more than a year of use. Even after moving production to Arc Royale, the numbers produced were insignificant. The Grey Death Legion found several Mark 21s in a cache on Karbala and turned them over to the new Avalon Institute of Science, which gave these designers a boost toward the eventual development of the Infiltrator Mark II battle armor. Through bits and pieces of equipment and information, the Nighthawk was returned to the Inner Sphere and even into the periphery. The NIOPS Association, a periphery state consisting of just three habitable planets in orbit around a dying star, was hit hard during the Word of Blake kerfuffle. Seeking whatever advantage they could, including access to Star League records and the remnants of Blakist battle armor following attacks, the NIOPS leadership was able to start producing their own Nighthawk units. When the Marian Hegemonius 6th Legio showed up to raid at NIOPS 5, the very well-equipped NIOPS infantry ran roughshod over the Marian troops thanks to an effective use of terrain and knowledge of the warehouses the Marian forces were trying to pillage. 
Never short on confidence, the Marians pressed their attack. However, when battle-armored Nyap soldiers swarmed the legs of a Marian Star Slayer battle mech and managed to take it down, the resolve of the Marians broke. I'd have loved to see the look on that mech warrior's face as dozens of battle-armored Nyap soldiers ran toward them like rabid kangaroos. While not unheard of, the Nighthawk is quite uncommon in marketplaces across the Inner Sphere. It's one of those things that you snap up when you see it for sale, even if you might not have an immediate use for it. The plethora of positive reports from the field guarantee that more likely or later, you're going to find a use. What I would love to see in the future for a resurgent Nighthawk design is a Mark 22 with some additional options for that left arm weapon. Changing nothing else on the design, a Fire Drake support needler, even a Rocket Launcher 4, or a light target acquisition gear package could make for some very interesting uses on the battlefield and behind enemy lines in combination with the Nighthawk's stealth armor. The Nighthawk stance is a solid recon and light infantry battle armor solution for those who can afford it and find it on the market. Your soldiers will appreciate it. Thanks for watching today's little journey into the history of Battletech Battle Armor. I feel like I'm gradually becoming an accidental expert on the topic, as it's been such a blast to dig into these older source books and technical readouts. We're going to keep plugging away at these battle armors for a while, just until I get distracted by something else that's shiny. If you enjoyed the video and want to see more, hit all the buttons, like, subscribe, so on and so forth. Taking the extra step to becoming a channel member provides access to the Discord channel, where the nonsense spigot flows. Big thanks to the recent new members, Mono No Aware, Telos, and Wildcat for taking that leap. I appreciate it more than words can properly express. Now take care, and until we meet again, please go out and make the world a slightly better place today and tomorrow.